There's an engine that represents the absolute peak of carburetor technology. Built at the exact moment before fuel injection made carburetors obsolete forever. It produces 245 horsepower from 350 cubic inches using nothing but air, fuel, and mechanical precision that modern engineers can't replicate. And most people have never heard of it because it only existed for two years before emissions regulations killed it. The 1970 Chevrolet LT1 small block V8 wasn't just another carbureted engine. It was the most technologically advanced, naturally aspirated carburetor engine ever mass-produced. Solid lifter camshaft with 0.520-inch lift, 11 to 1 compression ratio. Forged steel crankshaft, 4-bolt main caps. Rochester Quadrajet carburetor with vacuum secondaries calibrated so precisely that it could meter fuel within 2% accuracy across the entire RPM range. And then 1971 happened. Horsepower fell to 165. The camshaft was neutered. The engine was strangled by emissions equipment. The most advanced carbureted V8 ever built lasted exactly two model years before regulations destroyed everything that made it special. But here's what makes the 1970 LT1 the absolute peak of carburetor engineering. Every single component was optimized to the physical limits of mechanical fuel delivery. You couldn't make a carbureted engine better than this without fuel injection. Engineers threw every advanced technology available at this motor and created something that modern computer-controlled engines still struggle to match for pure mechanical elegance. This is why the 1970 Corvette LT1 represents the pinnacle of carbureted V8 design. What made it impossible to improve further, and why this two-year window produced an engine that will never be replicated. The carburetor on the LT1 wasn't some simple mixing device. The Rochester Quadrajet was the most sophisticated fuel metering system ever created without electronics. It had 12 separate fuel circuits, each precisely calibrated for different operating conditions. Idle circuit, transition circuit, main metering circuit, power enrichment circuit, accelerator pump circuit, and secondary circuits that only activated under heavy throttle. But here's what made it genius. The Quadrajet used a tiny primary bore. This created incredible fuel atomization at low speeds while still flowing enough air for high RPM power. Most carburetors compromise between low speed efficiency and high speed power. The Quadrajet didn't compromise. It was efficient at idle and powerful at redline. The primary venturists were so small that air velocity stayed high even at low throttle openings. High air velocity means better fuel atomization. Better atomization means more complete combustion. More complete combustion means more power and better fuel economy. The LT1 could idle smoothly at 800 revolutions per minute and pull cleanly from 1,000 revolutions per minute in top gear, something most carbureted engines couldn't do. The secondary system was vacuum-operated rather than mechanically linked. This meant the secondaries only opened when the engine actually needed them, based on manifold vacuum rather than throttle position. You could floor the throttle at low RPM, and the secondaries wouldn't open because vacuum was too low. But wind the engine to 4,000 revolutions per minute at wide open throttle, and those secondaries snapped open instantly, flowing massive amounts of air when the engine could actually use it. Tuning this carburetor required understanding all 12 circuits and how they interacted. The LT1's quadrajet was calibrated so precisely that changing the main jets by two sizes could make the engine run rich or lean across the entire power band. Modern fuel injection uses oxygen sensors and computer adjustments to achieve what the quadrajet did with mechanical precision and careful calibration. The LT1 used a solid lifter camshaft, not hydraulic. Solid lifters mean higher RPM capability more aggressive valve timing and zero lifter bleed down that robs power. But solid lifters also require valve adjustment every 12,000 miles. Chevrolet chose solid lifters because they wanted maximum performance and they were willing to accept the maintenance penalty. 
The cam specs were radical for a production engine. Duration of 346 degrees on the intake and 366 degrees on the exhaust. Lift of 0 0.520 inches. Overlap of 96 degrees. These are race engine numbers. In a production Corvette that you could buy from a dealer and drive on the street. But here's why these specs mattered. The aggressive overlap between intake and exhaust valve opening created a scavenging effect at high RPM. Exhaust gases exiting through the exhaust valve created a low-pressure wave that helped pull intake charge in through the intake valve. This effect didn't work at low RPM, which is why the LT1 had a lumpy idle and didn't make much power below 2,500 revolutions per minute. But above 4,000 revolutions per minute, that scavenging effect turned the engine into an absolute monster. The cam was ground on cores that were heat-treated to 60 Rockwell hardness. The lifters were tool steel with specific heat treatment to handle the aggressive ramps. The valve train components were designed to survive 6,500 revolutions per minute, sustained operation without failing. This wasn't just a hot cam thrown in a stock engine. Drivers who kept it above 4,000 revolutions per minute understood why this engine was special. 11 to 1 compression in a street engine. When most V8 sanks were running 9 to 1 or 10 to 1, Chevrolet built a production motor with compression high enough to require premium fuel and careful ignition timing. This single specification is what modern engines can't replicate because emissions regulations won't allow it. High compression means more thermal efficiency. Every time the piston compresses the air-fuel mixture, you're converting mechanical energy into thermal energy. Higher compression means you're squeezing more energy out of every combustion event. The LT1's 11 to 1 compression extracted more power from gasoline than engines with lower compression ratios. It's basic thermodynamics, and there's no way around it. But here's the problem with high compression. It causes knock or pre-ignition, where the air-fuel mixture detonates before the spark plug fires. Knock destroys engines by creating uncontrolled pressure spikes that hammer pistons and bearings. The only way to prevent knock at 11 to 1 compression is perfect fuel quality, precise ignition timing, and excellent combustion chamber design. The LT1 achieved this through chamber design borrowed from racing. The combustion chambers were CNC machined for consistency, with carefully shaped quench areas that squeezed the air-fuel mixture toward the spark plug. This promoted rapid flame propagation, burning the mixture completely before knock could occur. The chambers were also smaller than standard small block chambers, which is how Chevrolet achieved 11 to 1 without using crazy piston designs. The ignition system was upgraded to handle the advanced timing required for high compression. The distributor had a performance curve that started timing advance early and pulled in maximum advance by 3,000 revolutions per minute. At wide open throttle, the engine ran 36 degrees of total timing. That's aggressive for a street engine, but necessary to prevent knock at high compression. And then 1971 destroyed all of it. Compression dropped to 9 to 1 to run on lower octane unleaded fuel. Horsepower fell from 245 to 165. The engine went from a high compression screamer to a strangled smog motor in one model year. The 11 to 1 compression ratio was the first casualty of emissions regulations, and it took the LT1's character with it. The LT1 didn't just make power, it made power reliably. The internal components were overbuilt compared to standard small block Chevys. Forged steel crankshaft instead of cast iron. Forged pistons instead of cast. Four bolt main caps instead of two bolt. Shot peened connecting rods. These weren't just performance parts, they were durability upgrades. The crankshaft was forged from 1053 steel and heat treated. Forging aligns the grain structure of the metal, making it significantly stronger than cast iron. The journals were cross-drilled for improved oil flow to the rod bearings. The counterweights were heavier to balance the more aggressive piston and rod combination. 
This crank could handle 7,000 revolutions per minute, sustained operation without the harmonic vibration issues that destroyed cast cranks. The connecting rods were forged steel with shot peen surfaces. Shot peening compresses the surface of the metal, creating residual compressive stress that prevents crack initiation. Racing engines use this process because it significantly extends component life under high stress. Chevrolet used it in the LT1 because they knew people would abuse this engine. Four bolt main caps replaced the standard two bolt design. Main caps secure the crankshaft to the block. Two bolts are sufficient for normal operation. Four bolts are necessary when you're making 245 horsepower and revving to 6,500 revolutions per minute regularly. The additional bolts prevented the main caps from walking or fretting under heavy loads. Maintaining precise main bearing clearances, even under sustained high RPM operation. The pistons were forged aluminum with valve reliefs machined for the aggressive cam. Forged pistons are denser and stronger than cast pistons, with better thermal conductivity to prevent hot spots in detonation. The rings were chrome-faced for wear resistance. The wrist pins were full floating with Spiralox retainers. Every internal component was upgraded beyond what a 350 cubic inch street engine required. This wasn't just for power, it was for durability. Chevrolet knew that an engine making 245 horsepower would be driven hard, so they built it to survive that abuse. The LT1 could be redlined repeatedly without grenading itself, which was unusual for production engines in 1970. Not cast iron, aluminum dissipates heat faster, keeping the intake charge cooler. Cooler air is denser. Denser air means more oxygen per cylinder filling. More oxygen means more power. The switch from iron to aluminum was worth 5 con 7 horsepower just from reduced intake temperature. But the manifold design was also optimized for flow. The runners were tuned to a specific length that created a pressure wave resonance at peak torque RPM. When you close an intake valve, it creates a pressure wave that travels back up the intake runner, reflects off the plenum, and returns to the valve. If the runner length is correct, that pressure wave arrives just as the valve opens again, helping push more mixture into the cylinder. This is called intake runner tuning. And it only works at specific RPM ranges, which is why torque peaked at 4,000 revolutions per minute. Below that range, the pressure wave timing was wrong and you got no benefit. Above that range, the wave was out of phase again. But in that 4,000 to 5,000 revolutions per minute window, the intake design was adding 510 horsepower just from pressure wave dynamics. The plenum volume was calculated to provide adequate mixture distribution to all eight cylinders without creating turbulence that would disrupt flow. The carburetor mounting pad was machined flat to ensure perfect gasket seal. The EGR passages were integrated into the manifold design rather than being bolted on as an afterthought. The exhaust manifolds were cast iron, but they were high-flow designs with large ports and minimal restrictions. Most production exhaust manifolds are designed for cost and packaging, sacrificing flow for cheap manufacturing. The LT1 manifolds were designed for performance, first, with smooth internal passages and large exit ports that fed into a true dual exhaust system with minimal back pressure. The 1970 LT1 existed in a brief window where technology had advanced far enough to build incredibly sophisticated carbureted engines, but emissions regulations hadn't yet forced the switch to fuel injection. By 1975, emissions requirements made carburetors obsolete. The precision fuel metering required to meet EPA standards simply wasn't possible with mechanical carburation. Fuel injection can adjust mixture ratios in real time based on oxygen sensor feedback. Carburetors deliver whatever mixture they're calibrated for, regardless of conditions. If the air temperature changes, air density changes, and the carburetor's mixture changes, Fuel injection compensates automatically. Carburetors can't. Modern emission standards require precise control over air-fuel ratios to minimize unburned hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides. 
The three-way catalytic converter that modern cars use only works when the engine runs at stoichiometric ratio, 14.7 to 1, air fuel. Maintaining that ratio requires closed-loop fuel injection with oxygen sensors. A carburetor can get close, but it can't maintain stoichiometric across all operating conditions. The LT1 couldn't meet modern emission standards even if you wanted it to. The high compression causes increased nitrogen oxide formation. The carburetor can't maintain precise mixture control. The aggressive cam creates overlap that allows unburned mixture to escape into the exhaust. Everything that made this engine powerful makes it impossible to certify for emissions. And that's why we'll never see another carbureted engine this advanced. Not because the technology doesn't exist. The Quadrajet carburetor on the 1970 LT1 was as sophisticated as carburation could get. Engineers had pushed mechanical fuel delivery to its absolute limit. Going further required sensors, computers, and electronic fuel injection. 245 horsepower doesn't sound impressive by modern standards. A base model Mustang GT makes 480 horsepower now. But the LT1 made 245 horsepower naturally aspirated from 350 cubic inches using 1970 technology and pump gas. No turbochargers. No superchargers. No electronic engine management. Just mechanical precision and careful engineering. The power delivery was different from modern engines. Turbocharged engines make peak torque at 2,000 revolutions per minute and hold it flat to redline. The LT1 made nothing below 2,500 revolutions per minute and then came alive at 4,000 revolutions per minute. You had to work for the power. You had to downshift and keep the engine in its power band. Modern drivers would hate it. Enthusiasts understood that the challenge was part of the appeal. The sound was different too. The solid lifter valve train created a mechanical clatter at idle that modern hydraulic roller cam engines don't make. The aggressive cam overlap created a loping idle that sounded like a race car. The exhaust note changed character as the secondaries opened at 4,000 revolutions per minute. The engine had personality that modern electronically controlled engines lack. Maintaining an LT1 required skill that modern cars don't need. You had to adjust the solid lifters every 12,000 miles. You had to tune the carburetor for weather changes. You had to set ignition timing manually. Modern cars do all of this automatically with computers and sensors. The LT1 required you to understand how the engine worked and make adjustments yourself. This is what makes the 1970 LT1 special. It wasn't just an engine. It was the absolute pinnacle of mechanical engineering applied to internal combustion. Every component was optimized. Every system was designed to work at the edge of what carbureted technology could achieve. And when regulations forced the switch to fuel injection, this level of mechanical sophistication became obsolete overnight. The engineers who designed the LT1 knew they were building the last great carbureted V8. They threw every advanced technology available at it. Solid lifters. Forged internals. Sophisticated carburation. The result was an engine that represents the peak of what mechanical fuel delivery could accomplish before computers and emissions regulations changed everything. You'll never see another carbureted engine this advanced because the technology that replaced it is fundamentally better for emissions and efficiency. But for pure mechanical elegance and engineering achievement, the 1970 Chevrolet LT1 stands alone as the most sophisticated carbureted V8 ever mass-produced. Two years of production, 245 horsepower, the absolute limit of what carburation could achieve before fuel injection made it all obsolete.